Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Holly Misselbauer, and I am an IT project manager at Cornell University Library and the host for today's event. Our topic today is the Folio Technical Review Team Report. Today's session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted. We have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. The speakers will address the questions at the end of the presentation. If you like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum, but please know that we may not see your comments there during the forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Our speakers today are Michelle Suranovsky, who has roughly 20 years of experience as a systems admin and programmer and has been managing library systems at Lehigh University for about six years. She participated in the Too Cool Next Generation ILS Exploration and was a member of the OLA Technical Council. She Holly, led. The, yes. I'm sorry to jump in, but I think you're reading Chris's um, background or a mix of. Oh, really? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, Michelle, you want to introduce yourself then? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, it sounded like some of it was mine and some of it was Chris's. I think just in general, I've been at Lehigh for six years. I'm a developer and I have about 20 years of software development experience, mainly with web applications. Okay, so it sounds like the next, my middle sentence is, is where I messed up. Okay, and then I was going to say that you led the technical review team that created the report we're learning about today. Okay, so I must have grabbed one sentence from Chris's. Okay, so then Chris Manley is the coordinator of library systems at Cornell University Library. He manages the current ILS and related systems, as well as providing system support for the overall library server environment. He has been involved in the library's exploration of next generation library systems since 2011. And this is where I was supposed to say he participated in the Too Cool Next Generation ILS exploration and was a member of the OLA Technical Council. And as a member of the technical review team, he helped write the report that we're going to be discussing today. Our third presenter is Jakob Skosen. I hope I said his last name correctly. He is the lead architect and technical project manager at Index Data. He has a dual master's of science in computer science and information technology and has over 10 years of experience in building solutions within the library technology sector, both for libraries and vendors. Through Index Data, Jakob has been actively involved in open software development, initially as a developer, but now focusing on architecture. And he's leading a team of highly skilled developers. So I'd like to welcome our three speakers and let's begin. Michelle, I believe you're going to start. I think Chris started us off. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to kick things off with a little bit of uh, context. Um, I can. So back in uh, September, uh, the OLA board convened the technical review team to basically answer the question of is Folio going to be the, can Folio be the basis for developing our next generation library system? Um, the uh, OLA had been affiliated with the Quali organization uh, and we pivoted away from that and we're looking for a new, new, way, new approach 
um, and uh, in part uh, to answer some questions about uh, some grant funding, uh, we needed to convene and, and look at the state of folio and see where things were. Um, and I want to actually, before we get into the process of how we looked at it and things like that, which Michelle will talk about, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the fact that this turned out to be a difficult question to answer. Uh, the technical re review team actually struggled a bit to kind of get rolling early on uh, and to figure out how to answer the questions in our charge. Uh, and it, it actually took us a little while to coalesce even around our approach. Uh, and from there, it still, you know, it still ended up being a little murky. Uh, and I, I struggled a bit to understand why it was so hard. And I gave it some thought and I came up with, uh, came up with an explanation or at least an analogy that helped me understand it. And I want to share that with you. Um, because I think it's important for understanding uh, the process that we went through and that Folio is going through and for sort of setting our own expectations around what we should be looking for uh, as Folio develops. Uh, now this analogy might seem a little bit off the beaten path, uh, but I'm going to ask you to, to make a leap of faith and, and follow me down that path um, because like I said, I think it, it helps frame the discussion well. Uh, and so. Uh, I'm a cook, I, I, a hobbyist at least. I enjoy cooking, I enjoy making food uh, and exploring new recipes and things like that. Uh, and in such, uh, the kitchen that I'm working in, how it's equipped and how well things work, uh, the appliances, the layout and so on, it matters to me. Uh, and the kitchen in my house is, is decent, but it was built in the mid 80s and it's showing its age. Uh, and I often think about renovating it. Um, and, uh, you know, if you kind of imagine, my kitchen does a lot of what I need, but, but not necessarily as, as well as I'd like. Kind of, you know, like our, our library systems often do a lot of what we need, but not necessarily as well as we'd like. Uh, it has an electric cooktop where I'd really prefer to have a gas. Uh, the fridge is getting old and it's a bit small. Uh, on the other hand, I upgraded the, the oven a while back and that's doing just fine. Uh, some things are, are outdated. Uh, it has a garbage compactor, a feature that was pretty popular when the kitchen was built long before separating out different things into recycling bins and whatnot was an issue. Um, but actually the garbage compactor hasn't worked the entire time I've owned the house and I've never really missed it. Uh, the only reason I haven't ripped it out yet is I don't really have something else to sit in that spot. Other things are, are missing entirely, like a, a well-positioned rack for my pots and pans are a good place for some of those recycling bins. Uh, in many ways, my kitchen is like my institution's library management system. It was designed very well in its time, and it was well built. But some of the things are getting difficult to maintain, or at least seem so compared to their modern equivalents. And there are ways I use my kitchen now that differ from the vision of the person who designed that kitchen. There's also technology available now, like say LED lighting, that could allow more flexible options in the design, and those didn't exist when this was built. So let's say I decide to renovate that kitchen. I can go shop around at home centers and kitchen design stores. I look at cabinets and countertops and appliances, and I can make choices to trade off between cost and quality and features. I can think about how the available pieces fit with how I want to use my kitchen and how they fit into the physical space I have available. While the decisions are not always easy, especially if my budget is limited and I want, of course, you know, the best kitchen I can make, overall it's not a, it's a, not a hard process to understand. You know, wrapping my mind around these trade-offs and decisions is not difficult. But here's where starting to think about this process kicked in. We're not renovating our kitchen and we're not just looking at replacing our existing library systems. That would be a much simpler task of evaluating the current crop of competing products, selecting one, and implementing it. Instead, we are partnering with other organizations to design and build a workshop in which we and others will design and build the library equivalent of the kitchen of the future. Our partners, in this case, Index Data, have started setting up that workshop, and we're trying to decide, or you know, we were as part of this technical review team this fall, trying to decide if what they're setting up will let us build our new kitchen. And it's hard because we don't necessarily know what the kitchen of the future will look like. We know that the kitchen of the future will have some things in it that look a lot like what we have now. Sink, countertops, cabinets to store dishes and food. 
and we know that there are some technologies that will let us change things up a bit, like LED lighting that I mentioned that can be more flexibly arranged than traditional lighting. And some things on the horizon that we know will have an effect, but we're not quite sure what that effect will be. Say, you know, all the people that are, all the companies that are coming out with smart appliances. Um, we know from experience that in the lifetime of the kitchen, there will probably be at least one major disruptive force that we can't even really imagine yet. And ideally, we would like to at least have some allowances for that kind of flexibility going into the future. And so we're looking around this workshop that I mentioned, and we see some saws and hammers and screwdrivers and a bunch of other lumber off to the side. And we think, okay, we can make some cabinets out of that. And although they'd be better if we also had a dovetail jig for making the drawers. And we hear that, okay, the dovetail jig is on order, but it hasn't arrived yet. So, okay, that sounds good. And we say, is there some way to cut countertop material? And we hear that haven't decided uh, whether they're supporting laminate countertops or granite. And the tools you need for the, each of those is very different. So, But once they decide between those two, they'll order the appropriate tools and have that capability. And so the question we're trying to answer is, will this workshop let us build the kitchen that we want in the next few years? And that's a really hard question when the definition of this workshop is a moving target because they're ordering new tools and materials and bringing them in as, we, as we're sitting there. Um, and we're not sure really what the kitchen in the future is going to be like. Our current conception of kitchen design is based on the outdated kitchen we have now and what we like and don't like about it. Um, what will count as good and smart in the new kitchen design will be shaped in part by the capabilities of this workshop that itself is a moving target and our own ability to rethink the way we cook. Um, and so because of the speculative nature of all of that, we need to base our decision partly on what is there and how it has developed in the time we're examining it. Uh, the other part becomes a focus on the relationships and behavior of the people involved. And so we ask, do they listen to us? Do they want to listen to us? I've certainly worked with vendors in the, the library IT space uh, and, and in uh, IT in general uh, in the past who, who struggled to understand issues that seemed really obvious to me. I've worked with vendors who had already decided that they knew the right answer and had no particular interest in learning about how my organization worked and wanted to do its, uh, how to accomplish its goals. Uh, and it's certainly, in my experience, a much better process, much better experience when it's a collaborative partnership and when the perspectives of the various participants are melded into a whole that meets the bulk of everyone's needs. And that really, kind of came down, that, that was the essence of the question that the, tech, the technical review team was facing, is as Folio, as index data is building this workshop that we call Folio, and we're watching it develop, is that is there enough stuff there, is there enough capabilities there that we feel like we could start building our new kitchen, uh, and do we have the relationships with the people building that? Do we feel like our issues are being responded to, that our questions are being answered, um, and are mo things moving in the right direction at the right pace that we feel confident that we'll be able to get to where we need to be as far as building this new thing that we want to build? Um, and I think that we went in trying to evaluate uh, initially, you know, where is Folio compared to a list of ILS requirements? And that didn't work because so much of it is such a moving target. And we had to kind of regroup and look at it from this different perspective of what is the process and what is the traje trajectory rather than what's there right now. Um, and so I hope that that uh, sort of story gives you a little bit of context of sort of what to look for and what our experience was. And with that, I will hand things over to Michelle to talk about what we actually went through in this evaluation. Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, I don't think I have presenter. Holly, are you able to pass the presenter rights to me? 
Oh, there we go. Oh, no. Would it be possible for me to share my screen? Hi, Michelle. I see that you have the ball next to you. If when you go over to WebEx to share, can you choose to share your screen at this point? Yes. Okay. It looks like it's coming through. I'll let you know. Yes, and we're seeing your login for Google, and here we go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to describe our, our process and analysis and findings, but before I do, I want to give credit to all of the members of the technical review team. While Chris and I are here sharing all of this with you, the review was done with the efforts of this group of people from various Olay institutions. Um, as Chris mentioned, it was a struggle for us to find an approach, and it took a couple of weeks and a bit of trial and error, some reflection and some adjustment to get a productive process in place. Our jumping off point was this existing large list of architectural drivers, which included business goals, um, constraints, quality attributes, non-functional and, and key functional requirements. And by existing, I mean we were not the authors of this document. Our thought was we would sift through it and find items relevant to a technical review, trying to bring the most important pieces to the surface as points of analysis. But after a bit of working in this direction and feeling like we weren't making enough progress, someone in the group suggested that we take a different approach, which was looking at the Folio platform based on the three assessment perspectives described in our charge which were architectural considerations, operational considerations, and development considerations. The architectural driver spreadsheet we were, excuse me, we were working with contained many of these same considerations, but it was much more productive to take this step back and approach the evaluation from this higher level. Also, the goal of the review also became more clear at this point which was determine um, if this platform was ready for independent development by Olay developers. So we decided to break into three groups to focus on each of these three perspectives. Uh, Simon had already worked with the front end piece of the platform stripes, and by this time I had downloaded and started working with the Okapi framework, so he and I worked on the development considerations. The other two groups fell into place based on expertise. Dale, Micah, and Julian worked on architectural considerations, and Chris and Todd worked on operational considerations. So each group took time to formulate points of analysis for each of the three perspectives. And within these points of analysis were specific questions we wanted to ask index data. These lists of questions served as the agenda for the conference calls we held with Nassib and Yaakov from Index Data. The Q&A sessions, along with conversations in Slack, <clears throat> excuse me, downloading and working with existing code and documentation, and evaluating a list of conditions and statements that were part of Olay's proposal to Mellon form the basis of our analysis. Overarching all of this, our Q&A sessions and looking at the code and looking at um, what the expectations were, overarching all of it was the bottom line question we needed to answer, which was, is this platform viable for Olay to independently develop modules using it? And before I describe the findings of the review, I want to point out that these conversations and code reviews took place in October. So the findings I'm describing are already 90, day to, 90 days old. 
we found the platform meets the criteria that Olay and Mellon are looking for in many ways, such as using open source and well-supported technologies and using established frameworks for user interface and data exchange, just to name a couple. However, it's missing some important components. And in our report, we pointed out four specific things that we felt would be critical to support application development. The first is Stripes, the user interface. At the time of our evaluation, the Stripes toolkit was very much evolving, although we got the impression that it was really starting to take shape. And the other three missing pieces were related to the data module layer of the application, which was um, the platform was missing a finalized design for data persistence, is missing an implementation for roles and permissions, and a lack of support for multi-tenancy. But I want to take a step back and look at the entire platform so I can be really clear about where the missing pieces are. This is a really high-level diagram of the pieces of the Folio platform, the Stripes toolkit, the Okapi framework, and the data modules. The Okapi framework, which in my view is like a gateway for all of the API calls to the data modules, appeared to be the most evolved part of the platform. The Okapi framework lets you configure using its APIs what data modules it will communicate requests to. And this is not limited to native folio data modules. You can also configure Okapi to communicate with external APIs you just have to point the configuration to the API endpoint, and it will treat any API as it does modules internal to Folio, which I really appreciate this flexibility. Okapi understands the concept of tenants, meaning after you inform it of data modules that it will be communicating with, you specify which tenants have access to which modules, and it deals with the request appropriately. It also has a mechanism for defining permissions for each endpoint, and all of this configuration is done using the Okapi API. The other really positive thing I wanted to point out about Okapi um, is the thoroughness of the documentation. The documentation that is out there makes it really easy to download, build, get it running, and configure it. The, there are lots of clear instructions and really good examples. The data modules part of the platform is less fleshed out. This is where the missing pieces are that I mentioned. At the time of our review, some of the modules were using MongoDB and others were using Postgres, but I believe they did make a decision to go with Postgres near the end of our review. There was also no support for roles and permissions at this level of the platform, and there was a lack of support for multi-tenancy. At the Okapi layer, the tenant ID was recognized in the request and passed into the data module layer, but there was not a consistent design in the data module layer to deal with that tenant ID. So in general, you can see that at the time of our review, some of the pieces of the framework were ready for independent development and others were not. However, our final report um, didn't only consider what code is done and what code is not done. It was our recommendation to hire Olay developers early in 2017, even if there was missing functionality in the platform. Um, we believe that just as the functional ex experts are involved at this early phase, having Olay developers involved early will help shape the platform with real data and real use cases, and that's just going to really make it better. Um, that's all that I have to talk about, about the, um, the review, but I did want to just uh, take a second to thank Index Data. Being a developer myself, it's really difficult to come into a project that people have been designing and working on for over a year and start asking really tough questions like, why are you doing it this way, and pointing out things that are missing. Uh, it's not fun and honestly a tiny bit uncomfortable, but thankfully, um, Naseeb and Sebastian and, and Jakob and the, all of the folks at Index Data that answered questions on Slack really couldn't have been nicer. They were just very open to answering our questions and having a dialogue with us and going so far as to asking us to break some of their assumptions and provide the really tough use cases. 
Um, they also made it clear that they want this project to be very transparent, which at least for me lightened the load a bit. Um, truthfully, they couldn't have been more gracious, and we've already thanked them, but I want to thank them in this forum. So that's all I have. If, if I may just uh, offer a comment. Uh, thanks, Michelle, for those kind words. Uh, I, it goes also the other way. I think the series of meetings we had, the conference calls we had, and the documents you guys prepared, those were really useful uh, to, um, uh, to inform our designs and, and, and generally the priority of things uh, that we should tackle. Uh, I also just want to use this opportunity to uh, thank OLA developers who are helping us. Um, uh, Simon is, is no longer working with us, but uh, now it's Jeremy and Matt, uh, Francis and Julian. Uh, they're really high skilled developers helping us build both the core and, and, and the exemplar app that we're working on. And I think it's, it's going really, really good with, um, with their participation and, and, and they offer good ideas and we're really, uh, really uh, looking into uh, moving the platform, especially in the places where it's, it's missing the functionality. And I totally agree with your assessment. Um, uh, things have improved uh, over the last 90 days since the since the report was prepared. Uh, especially the permission uh, permission model is uh, is now uh, much better fleshed out. Uh, we are currently implementing the initial uh, uh, the initial um, uh, working on the initial implementation. Uh, we also have the authentication uh, module, uh, uh, the, the, the user management module. Uh, I'm sorry, fully migrated to Postgres. And as you as you mentioned, the decision has been to move all, all of those modules to Postgres, uh, and that's uh, that's uh, that's that's being completed as we as we speak. So so the improvements are there, but uh, there's still a lot of uh, moving pieces, obviously, and, and we hope to collaborate uh, on, on both designing and implementing those uh, with a light. Um, this is Holly. Um, I'm checking in to see is, if is the presentation completed. Or did we lose Jakob? Uh, oh, that's, that's, that's all for my part. I was mostly uh, just on the hands to offer some comments and, and, and up, update the, the, the state of, of the talk term, but I think that's pretty much it. <coughs> Okay, so um, now we have plenty of time for people to ask questions. So please uh, type your questions into the, uh, the Q&A box on, on the uh, WebEx screen. Um, we don't have any questions so far, but if you have one, please go ahead. And if uh, someone else uh, who is a panelist has a question, they can go ahead and ask. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't look like we have, oh, let me see, I have, I have one message here. Okay, so uh, we'll give people a little bit of time to uh, think about any questions that they, that they may have. Um, this is a, a good time for me to talk about something that, that the Olay partners have coming up. Um, we're going to be posting three uh, positions for developers uh, very shortly. And uh, let me see if I have the job description right here. Oh, I guess I don't. Uh, so if, if, if you will check back to our website, it's openlibraryenvironment.org 
Uh, we will be posting those positions shortly for developers. And we'd love to have uh, people who are listening right now or people that you know uh, apply for those positions. So we hope to have, have the information on the website soon. So please check back. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, so Jakob, could you maybe fill us in a little bit more about the uh, progress that is being made or will be made on things that were identified as needing work? Sure. Um, so, as far as I remember, Michelle mentioned migration to Postgres. Uh, that is uh, completed for um, two of uh, the three active modules that we currently have in the system. Uh, so uh, the mods uh, users, which is which is the user uh, metadata management module, has been fully migrated to Postgres. Um, the authentication modules and permission management module are being migrated as we speak, and uh, we hope to uh, complete that migration by the end of the current sprint. Uh, this means uh, uh, no later than next week. Um, and mod metadata, which is the sort of initial implementation of the metadata management module that Kay and uh, our partner is working on, is also complete. Uh, so, so those things, um, those, that's that's the major difference compared to uh, the, the state of things uh, when the, the, way the report was made. Uh, uh, as I also mentioned, the permission uh, permission uh, design um, has been fleshed out, and uh, we have an initial implementation of the permission module and. Um, and the whole model for reporting permissions uh, from the module descriptors, uh, so from the, the module metadata uh, down to the system, and then building uh, roles, you could call them roles, and we call them permission sets, but uh, sort of grouping those uh, within, the, uh, within the system using the, the permission management module. Uh, that has been also complete, but as I mentioned, that's being migra migrated to Postgres uh, and will be, uh, uh, that, that will be completed next week. Um, other than that, I uh, don't necessarily remember. Was there anything else uh, uh, that you mentioned, Michelle, that I should uh, that I should comment on? The multi-tenancy. Sure, the multi-tenancy. Yeah, as you mentioned, Okapi has um, has uh, has, uh, has sort of negative support for multi multi-tenancy. The ability to enable modules for different different configuration, different modules for different tenants. That that's been there from day one. Um, however, within the system modules, uh, specifically persistency uh, providing modules, that has been sort of left undefined. Uh, that was kind of on purpose. Uh, we weren't sure what uh, what sort of uh, uh, multi-tenancy approach in the da data layer we we were going to take. Especially that initially, as you mentioned, we were using Mongo. Uh, Mongo was never there to stay. We have used Mongo uh, because it's very easy uh, to you know, rapidly prototype on top of Mongo since it's schema-less and, and, and will, uh, will happily deal with uh, arbitrary JSON. That was very useful in the initial stages when we were playing with a lot of different designs uh, and, 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 and schemas for the data. But since we are sort of nearing a point where the, the schemas for the uh, for the data are being established, and that happens through six, uh, so the special interest groups and and, and our usability team. Uh, I don't know, but maybe Peter can, can talk more to that. Um, uh, we want to have a system where uh, a more stable system, and, and uh, we have been talking both to LA developers, LA technical council. Uh, and uh, knowledge integration. Uh, so, so our partner, who's uh, who's, um, uh, who's been involved in the implementation of the Go KB system, and we, it was clear that uh, Postgres is, is is the preferred solution among all those uh, developers. So that has been selected, and we have migrated over to that. Um, in terms of uh, dealing with multi-tenancy on the data layer, uh, we have. Uh, we have uh, been working on uh, the so-called module lifecycle, so uh, a series of calls uh, that um, 
uh, that the platform performs when modules are enabled, disabled, uh, upgraded, etc. So pretty much uh, as the modules are established, registered in the platform uh, for a given tenant, uh, uh, we can now uh, we can now capture those uh, those those lifecycle uh, events and react to those. And uh, the server-side framework uh, that we call uh, the, the Rammel module builder, which is our server-side framework, at least for people wanting to use Java as the language of choice for implementing uh, server-side modules comes with capabilities um, uh, with, um, with, a, with a default implementation of those, uh, of those lifecycle callbacks and, um, and, uh, and some examples on, on how to deal with multi-tenancy. Uh, specifically in Postgres, we went for uh, schema separation. Uh, that's the kind of approach. We, we're still leaving uh, options open and, and door open for other approaches. Uh, um, but there are certain things that will, uh, uh, um, uh, because of the way the ten, uh, tenant API is, is, is structured, uh, certain approaches like schema-based uh, multi-tenancy uh, uh, will, will be easier rather than uh, than other approaches, like for example, low-level security and then sharing one database or handling uh, or running the completely completely separate database instances. So. Uh, there's an example of that. Um, again, we want the platform to be as open as possible uh, in, in, in that manner, but there is an existing implementation and, 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 and examples, and if, uh, for most modules, I, I, I would guess it's a good idea to just follow, uh, follow the, the default that is, uh, uh, that is encoded in the, in the RAML module builder. So, so things have changed in terms, in terms of examples, in terms of uh, our approaches, and, and we will be, of course, encouraging the developers to follow those, those, those approaches. But I wouldn't say this is, this is fully complete. Uh, we are still sort of investigating other options. And, and also, uh, before we have some more data from, uh, from a running system, uh, so, uh, uh, so after after the whole cluster is, is, is configured, we want to be able to see uh, how different uh, different approaches behave in terms of performance. Uh, when we put some uh, um, uh, some non-trivial load on top of it, and that also might change our ideas. So, so as I say, we want to keep the platform very open. But but so one approach has been established and implemented, and, and, and that should give us something uh, to work with moving forward. Thanks, Jakob. Uh, we have a question um, directed towards uh, Chris from a former Cornell colleague of ours. Uh, hi. Anyway, uh, he asks if um, if we sought if we have or sought access to other ILS future roadmaps in terms of architecture. So uh, when we were looking at other products. Did we have access to their roadmaps of what was going to happen in the future, uh, Chris? Yeah. Um, so the yeah we we as part of this process we were not we were not specifically doing sort of competitive analysis and I think part of that really comes from the the recent history that led us down this road, which is to say that. Uh, the uh, the Olay organization has been developing uh, the the Olay based on Kuali Rice for for several years now, um, and some institutions have implemented it, but there was a decision made to uh, to make a break with the Kuali uh, organization uh, administratively, and uh, also a recognition of the need to move away from Rice as an underlying platform for the application. So there was going to need to be a really new approach, both technically and administratively, to this vision of an open library system that was designed and built by and for the community. And so, uh, you know, uh, overlapping or, or coinciding with this in time was EBSCO and Index Data's interest in uh, building something that as it turns out, matched that vision pretty well. And so uh, it really was going down the road of more than saying, hey, what's out there? What can we pick from? It was more of an, uh, a question of how do we realize, what's the best way to realize this vision that we have of a modern uh, community, developed community designed 
library system that will meet our needs both now and going into the futures. So, uh, you know, certainly we were, as part of this, aware of the capabilities of existing ILS systems. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, since I was coming into this from Cornell and we had been looking at one point at Alma, uh, you know, I was aware of at least some of the capabilities and sort of design goals of Alma as a system. Um, we were aware of the capabilities of the Kuali Rice-based Olay as a system. Uh, so it was not uh, without awareness of the context of other possibilities, but um, that was not the focus of our exploration. It was more comparing what's there in Folio to the vision of what we wanted to see built. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we also had a question about uh, upcoming conferences with, um, let me see where the question is. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I have to scroll down a little bit here. Okay, the person said, I know the Spring National Code for Life conference will have some pre-conference install and play folio sessions. Do you know of any other upcoming, upcoming conferences with this kind of hands-on work for developers? Uh, Peter Murray from Index Data answered uh, the question and said, you know, keep an eye on the events calendar and the newsletter, and also mentioned that, uh, that Folio will have a self-guided tutorial similar to the Dive into Hydra tutorial. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, what, what we would like to know is where uh, any of the listeners or the, the, the people who are attending would think it would be valuable to have an install and play uh, workshop. So um, I guess we're answering a question with a question, which is, you know, where do you think uh, it would be worthwhile to uh, have in, an install and play workshop? So, um, you know, you could post that into uh, the Q&A uh, box um, or follow up uh, with us via our website, um, which is openlibraryenvironment.org. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay. Okay, so there, uh, someone has mentioned uh, Canada's Access Conference. Okay, so I think, uh, I think Mike Winkler is answering that question. Okay, so final call for questions. Oh, very nice, thank you. Okay, so this concludes uh, today's Folio Forum on the Folio Technical Review Team Report. You can continue this conversation at the Folio Discussion website. It's discuss.folio.org and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the openlibraryenvironment.org website. Our next Folio Forum will be on January 18th. Uh, normally, we do these every two weeks, but due to the uh, holidays, our, we've gotten a little bit, uh, our schedule's gotten a little bit jumbled. So it will be in one week, one week from today. And the topic is going to be design your own folio app, no need to be a programmer. And this is by Philip Jakobsen. And um, I know I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, so um, please uh, sign up. Uh, you can go to the same website that I've mentioned before, openlibraryenvironment.org, to register and get more information. I'd like to thank our speakers today, Michelle, Chris, and Jakob, and to everyone who asked questions, and to everyone who attended. We appreciate your attendance. Um, so thank you very much, and have a good rest of the day.